he grabs the woman's face like so aggressively to go kiss her and it's like weird to me and it's like the second time they've met and I'm like what is happening why My name is Danny. So I, like many other college students, just wrapped up the semester that had to be transferred online because, you know, global pandemic and everything. So I took a seminar course on film noir and every week we watched a new film. So I'm going to be taking those 12 films, I believe, and tier ranking them for you guys. So to give you a very basic understanding of film noir before I go into this, film noir is a genre of film that was popular around the 1930s and 1940s and usually featured a lot of dark imagery in the cinematography and also covered a lot of dark themes. Hence the term film noir because noir means black in French because a bunch of French film theorists were the ones that came up with the term. And most films noir also had a character referred to as the femme fatale which was usually the female character Character that would bring the main protagonist to his doom in one way or another. So without further ado, let's get into it. So now I'm not going to do this in any particular order, I'm just going to kind of go for it. The first film we have is Laura and this was directed by Otto Preminger. Um, from what I can recall, the woman that this film follows is named Laura, as the title suggests, and I believe that she was murdered and there's this detective that is trying to figure out who could have murdered her, but then there's a little bit of a twist. I did like this film because it kind of twisted the traditional femme fatale trope, but it wasn't my absolute favorite film that I ever watched in this class, but it was definitely a very good film. The next film is The Big Sleep, which was directed by Howard Hawk, and it features uh, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. And the funny thing about this film is that I believe this was the film where uh, Bacall and Bogart actually fell in love because they ended up do going on to get married. And I just think that's really cute. However, the film... It really wasn't that good. I barely remember anything of this. I did like Humphrey Bogart's acting. However, in one of the other films that we watched, which I'm gonna cover in just a second, I believe his acting was far superior and I also like the story of that film much better. So I'm gonna put this in bad tier because I just genuinely do not recall anything of this film. I think that's also partly because I think I was just getting over a cold when I had to go to class and watch this film, which obviously I will not be doing anymore because of our, you know, new normal as it's been quoted many times by many people. We're gonna move on to In a Lonely Place, which also features Humphrey Bogart, and I'm gonna put this in great tier because this film was so good because I loved seeing Humphrey Bogart having a much more commanding kind of character to portray and I think he did it absolutely fantastically. I also love the way that this film uh, tackled a bit of like domestic violence and especially for the time frame of when this film was made, I thought it was great that there was just a little bit of critique of that. The story was great, it wasn't really slow because a lot of films noir can tend to be slow in the beginning but I really liked the pace of this film. Now the next one is Chinatown. And I'm conflicted on this because if we're just looking at the film itself, I loved this film. I think it was my absolute favorite film that we watched in this class. It was made in 1972, I believe is the year. And it's definitely more a neo-noir film because it is made in color, but it features a lot of the shadows and the storyline of a private eye detective that is very common in films noir. And I just love the storyline, especially I think because it was made in the 70s, they were able to tackle a lot more serious topics than they could probably in the 30s and 40s, especially because of the massive censorship in Hollywood that was at the time before World War II. However, I have problems with this film after discovering problems with the director, Roman Polanski. You can do some more research on your own, but in short, he's basically another Harvey Weinstein. And we don't need another one of those in film. We need a lot more women in film. We don't need all these power dynamics that are portrayed by a bunch of, frankly, usually white, old men in Hollywood and it's getting annoying and that's why I struggle with this film because it's definitely a really really good piece but the director is certainly very problematic but I'm still gonna put if we're just talking about the film in great tier. The next film here is Touch of Evil and this was directed by Orson Welles who also directed Citizen Kane which is said to be one of the greatest films of all time which I'm going to fight every single film professor that says that because it's not. 
I'm sorry. However, I do recognize its historical significance and his, the significance of having a bunch of new technology like deep focus, which now is used in a lot of films, um, and also just the narrative structure, which was very new at the time. However, I just did not like that film. I distinctly remember that there was a bird that squawked. It was the weirdest thing. Like there was a shot of a bird and then it dissolved into the next frame and then you heard the bird screech as it was dissolving and I swear, like I was about to fall asleep and then that bird woke me up and I think some of us were theorizing after we watched the film that they did that purposely because people were falling asleep watching that film. So, would not recommend that film. I also wouldn't really recommend Touch of Evil. I'm gonna put it in okay though, because especially comparing it to Citizen Kane, I like this better. But in Citizen Kane, Orson Welles actually starred as the main protagonist. He also stars in Touch of Evil. I forget the character's name. It's definitely very interesting to see him act and also direct, because I definitely think he has a good sense of direction. However, it's just not my favorite film, but I definitely did like that this film didn't really go into the traditional form of a femme fatale. There's definitely an argument for the woman to be considered a femme fatale or to not be considered a femme fatale, but it's definitely like teeters on that line and she's in no way a traditional femme fatale that seduces a man, especially because she is actually already married to her husband in this film. This is, I think, one of the only ones, if not the only film, where the main couple is, starts out already with an established relationship, and I liked seeing that. So then on to the next film, which is Double Indemnity. This is one of the prime examples of film noir that you will probably see around, but I'm gonna, just going to put it in okay, because I definitely really liked Barbara Stanwyck's acting in this film. She is definitely the embodiment of a very evil femme fatale that is common in films noir, especially because she actually, I think she ends up killing like two people. So she's a very strong woman who can hold her own in the world. But I've also noticed in a lot of films noir, there's also that like insta-love that is common in young adult books that I see, which I absolutely hate. And also I remember distinctly in this film, it was either in this film or the other film called Pushover that Fred McMurray was also acting in. He grabs the woman's face like so aggressively to go kiss her and it's like weird to me and it's like the second time they've met and I'm like, what is happening? Why? So there's definitely issues there and with plot, but it's still a good film, uh, just not one of my favorites. Okay, the next film is Pick Up on South Street, and I think I'm going to put this one in good tier because this was a little bit different than the other films that we had watched up to this point. Um, I really liked this one because it had much more of that mystery to it. There was also an older woman who... I forget the actress's name, but she was definitely one of my favorite characters, but she has a very tragic end, unfortunately, but she was awesome. The actress was awesome. I love the character. This film also kind of plays in the femme fatale as well. And there's also an interesting relationship. It's almost like an enemies to lovers kind of thing that happens in this one. All right, next is Gilda, and I'm going to put this in good tier because this one, I believe I watched this one after I watched Laura. And in this film, Rita Hayworth is amazing. She's such a commanding actress. She just has this on uh, this amazing on-screen presence that really came across in this film. And she's also one of those um, femme fatales that has a lot of sarcasm and witty lines, and I really like that. I kind of like seeing these strong women, however, they are kind of these uh, very male representations of women. However, a lot of them are strong, but a lot of them are not. So it really depends on what film you watch. But this one, I really liked her, but this one, I really love really Hayworth's acting, and I thought it was just a really good film. This one, The Long Goodbye. Hmm, I don't know if I want to put it in bad or terrible. You know what, I'm going to put in terrible just because this film is really long. It was definitely one of the longest ones that we watched. And I think this was the first or maybe the second film that I had to watch sitting at home. I think this one was made in the 70s. This is definitely a neo-noir. It just wasn't my favorite story. It was really, really slow. I also was not a huge fan of the actor. I found the plot to be a little convoluted as I went through it. So it's definitely one of those films you really have to sit through. We did like a midterm exam for this class and we had we were asked about our opinion on 
a couple of the films that we had just recently watched. And my professor asked how would the long goodbye or body heat, which is a film I'm going to talk about in a second, how would they be different if a woman had directed them? And my roommate, who also took the class with me, she was explaining how if a woman had directed it, that this film would have been a lot less convoluted and probably would have been much better. Because there, I think the weird, really weird thing about this film was that there was a, this weird fascination with the neighbors of the main character. I believe his name was Philip Marlowe. I could be wrong. But the neighbors across from him, there was like a bunch of women that were living together. And I guess they had like this hippie vibe from I was getting. And a lot of the times they never, they weren't wearing any sort of top, which like it is what it is. But I just thought it was weird that whenever we saw the neighbors, they were all, most of the time, they were always like didn't have any tops on and like you know there's always some of the comments from the other male characters but the main the main male character never actually says anything about that so that's kind of nice you know but I just thought it was weird that that was included but it might have just been a 70s thing that I don't get so who knows but regardless not my favorite film that I watched in this class I'm gonna put body heat in bad or okay. I don't know. I'm debating on this one. This one I might change as I start talking about it. But this one I found so hard to finish because basically the premise of this film is that it's very loosely based on double indemnity. And the very basic premise of double indemnity is this woman is unhappy with her husband, so she wants to kill him so that she can get his insurance money. So Body Heat has that same very basic premise, but because it's made in the 70s, it actually has a lot more development with the main female protagonist, which is nice to see. However, there is definitely a lot of depictions of the two characters doing the dirty, um, which it was just a little bit much. Like, I get it, it's the 70s, you can get away with that now because films in the 30s and 40s could not because censorship, they could barely even, like, allude to stuff. They had to use a lot of innuendos back then, but now, you know, it's the 70s, we don't care. You can do whatever you want. I always just find those are a bit odd, especially considering like the whole male gaze theory. I always find it's especially present in those sorts of scenes, so they just make me slightly uncomfortable. Um, but also I just wasn't a huge fan of the whole plot of this film. Definitely not my favorite. I probably will not watch it ever again. And the last film we have here is Pushover, which was the very first film that we watched. The stars Fred McMurray, and I forget the actress's name. I'm going to put it in bad tier, just because looking back on it now, I didn't see it immediately when I was watching it, but I do find it a bit creepy because the Fred McMurray plays like a detective in a police force, I'm pretty sure, and there's this woman that's involved with this man who they're trying to find, so in order to find out his whereabouts, they spy on her through her window. So that's mildly creepy, but then Fred McMurray ends up falling in love with her and wanting to save her. So it's just like, what? I don't... I you know, I have no explanation. It's not my favorite, because as we can tell, I like more the neo-noir or like later noir films because they have a little bit more societal critique in them. So that, guys, was me ranking all of the films noir that I watched in my film noir class, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. This is a little bit different video, but I thought it was really fun to do, especially because I just finished out the semester. So I hope you guys enjoyed this, and I will see you guys all later. Bye!